So good afternoon or good morning, everybody, and uh, whatever time of day you turn, you, you access this in the future. My name is Gareth Tudor-Williams. I'm a professor of pediatric infectious diseases at Imperial College, and I've been a consultant in pediatric infectious diseases at St. Mary's Hospital, at now ICHT, for more than 25 years. And you might well ask, what am I doing giving a talk like this? on trans transaminases, which of course, race transaminases is something all of us come across in all sorts of different disciplines. And the answer is that I've been interested in bloodborne viruses for all of these years. And many years ago, I set up a clinic, um, a family clinic for children and their family members, parents, siblings, and so on, where particularly hepatitis B and hepatitis C were an issue within the family. And my key to success in terms of uh, how you set up and run a cutting edge viral hepatology service for children is this, hijack an adult. And the adult I hijacked, actually, actually was not the first adult I hijacked, but um, he has uh, become a professor in the time that we've been working together, which is more than 15 years. And he's a consultant hepatology colleague at ICHT and, and a very wonderful person and has taught me a huge amount, runs a very, very big service for uh, hep C and hep B infected adults. And we've been able to use that to really drive forwards the, um, the, 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 the work for children. And particularly right now, bringing hepatitis C curative treatment down the age range. So we've just started treatment for a seven-year-old. So things are really looking, looking very good from that point of view. But I've already put a talk into this series about the work in, in viral hepatitis and uh, other bloodborne viruses. And so today, I want to look at the issue about transaminitis. So raised transaminases, these are common in pediatric and indeed in adult practice. And often, of course, there's a reasonable explanation and, and over investigation is not what's needed. But what I would say from the years of looking after children and watching them emerge into adulthood is that the failure to evaluate mildly but persistently raised transaminases risks missing an early diagnosis of something that is potentially treatable and is going to cause trouble if you don't make the diagnosis. And the point about raised transaminases is, is that it's one of those features that has a myriad of different possibilities uh, that may be the cause. But the long-term outcomes are not dissimilar. And these are the kind of long-term outcomes of persistent low-grade hepatitis of raised transaminases. So you've got cirrhosis of the liver, you've got hepatocellular carcinoma, you've got end-stage liver disease with uh, gross ascites and the caput medusae of the altered venous return. And of course, that's associated with esophageal varices and hematemeses. And, uh, and, and uh, in the end, end-stage liver failure is going to require transplantation. And I think the reason that pediatricians are so good at ignoring raised transaminases is that all of these consequences are going to happen 20 years downstream or more. And so we don't see them in our pediatric practice. And so you don't pay as much attention as I think we should. And I guess if there's only one take home message, it's precisely that, that I would not want you to ignore persistently raised, even low grade hepatitis. And what I've done to try and illustrate this again over the years is, is to collaborate with various trainees along the way and ask them, okay, just before we do this session, this teaching session, just go and have a look across the general peds intake at the cases that have got raised transaminases right now on the ward. And there are always several. And of course, some of them are very obvious what the causes are, and some of them are not so obvious. So let's just give you a little flavor of that, a number of different scenarios. So eight week old, presenting complaint, two days of fever, quite high fever, vomiting feeds, intermittent cough. And this baby was born at 35 weeks. So there was a concern about chorioamnionitis. The baby got 48 hours of IV antibiotics, but seemed to be very well. Um, hasn't yet had the first set of immunization. There is an issue. Mum has had depression is on, on sertraline, and, and I can't even pronounce that. Um, and on examination, this baby is miserable and 
febrile and a bit mottled, but actually the, the capillary refill time was okay. And you can see the investigations. So this child undergoes a full septic screen, but amongst the investigations is a low-grade transaminitis, an ALT of 61. And the albumin is down a bit. Um, and you can see from the CSF that this is a largely mononuclear um, inflammatory response. Um, there's no growth at two days. The urine dipstick is negative, And we could spend time asking about the likely cause of the transaminitis. It's also going to be the same cause as the meningitis. And in this instance, it was an enterovirus that was causing the, both the meningitis and obviously the transaminitis. But again, you know, I would follow that child and just make sure that the transaminases in um, recovery do, do return to normal. Totally different case, three-year-old now, presenting complaint, eight days of fever, lethargy, vomiting, and jaundice. And the background is that this child had traveled from Syria um, in the middle of that conflict um, and had arrived in the UK via the Lebanon and, and Turkey. Um, normally well, hadn't been in contact with anybody they knew to be jaundiced. Um, and the child was really quite deeply jaundiced uh, and uh, had a, a large liver and a bit of splenomegaly. Megaly. And again, you can see here the liver function test with a cracking transaminitis. I have to say, in, in the COVID lockdown, we had a boy from Khartoum who was five years old and whose dad was working between the Sudan and the UK. Not a dissimilar story. Arrived in the UK and three weeks later developed uh, a transaminases that were up in the 3000s um, and a very similar story. So the travel history is obviously of great interest to us. Um, just let me admit somebody here. And, um, and you can see that the child's bilirubin was pretty high, um, mostly uh, was a mixed picture of conjugated and unconjugated. Um, and so and they'd done a gamma GT. The differential diagnosis, uh, well, I'm not going to um, go through it all right now, but amongst the many investigations that were done, revealed evidence of acute hepatitis. And so um, you can see here, sorry, you can see here that the hepatitis A IgM was positive, which is clearly not because of vaccination and was consistent with the diagnosis of acute hep A. And the child clinically uh, was already improving and discharged fairly swiftly. Um, but again, you know, we would want to follow it. Hepatitis A very, very rarely causes fulminant liver failure. It, it contributes almost nothing to the global statistics that tell us that viral hepatitis is now a more common cause of death worldwide than either malaria or uh, HIV, and indeed it probably has overtaken uh, TB as a cause of death um, worldwide. Viral hepatitis, but as I say, hepatitis A contributes very little to that. So here's a 14-year-old girl, five days of fever, has had some rigors, is feeling rubbish, she's got headaches, she's had some vomiting, she's got abdominal pain, and she's a bit pale and she's also mildly jaundiced. She's got some right upper quadrant tenderness and hepatosplenomegaly. And these are the findings, again, with a low-level transaminitis, um, CRP in that mid-zone, mid 59, um, albumin's down. What further history would you want? What investigations are you going to do? And what's the diagnosis? And of course here, the travel history is awfully important. And this girl had malaria. All I'm trying to do is just to, to point out that the, the liver takes a hit because it's such an important organ in terms of, um, of, of all of its metabolic and immune functions. Three-year-old boy, Referbal GP has been febrile for four days, has had coryza, conjunctivitis, and cracked lips. And on examination, you can see this uh, um, array of signs. And what do you think is going on here? Uh, I'm sure absolutely every one of you is thinking along the same lines as Dr. House, who I'm going to show you in a moment. ALT 161, bilirubin really quite significantly raised, and the CRP up there. 133. And the first thing that comes to mind is Kawasaki's. And 
I think it's worth knowing that hydroxyl of the gallbladder is not at all uncommon in Kawasaki's, and we see that in a proportion of the children with a significant um, bilirubinemia and jaundice occasionally. And of course, in the current era of the COVID epidemic, um, you will also be thinking about the post-COVID pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome, so, so PIMS, TS, or MIS-C that Liz Whitaker and colleagues published last year. Um, okay, and then I just want to tell you about a case that, <laughs> uh, that I have to say really focused my attention because this happened about three weeks after I became a consultant at St. Mary's and the child was admitted under the general paediatricians and things didn't go according to plan. So the story was of a female infant um, born actually in our private wing, um, forceps delivery at term, no real problems initially, there was a little scalp abrasion at the vertex which was attributed to the forceps, but mum had developed fever on the day of delivery and she got flu-like symptoms and actually she said to me afterwards that she felt as unwell as she'd ever felt in her life. Um, and she ended up on uh, IV antibiotics, but the cultures were all negative and she began to feel a bit better and the baby and her were both discharged day three. But at day nine, the health visitor referred the child back to our ED because of increasing lethargy and poor feeding um, and low grade fever. And, uh, and the child was a little dehydrated. And the scalp lesion that had been healing now seemed to be more red. So we're at day nine at the moment. And you can see the vital signs and the child was a bit irritable. The cap return was uh, already a little prolonged. Um, the scalp lesion was described as a small central dry eschar with some surrounding erythema. Nobody thought too much of it, although obviously there was a concern about maybe it could be a bit of staph or something. Um, the liver was, was palpable but not enlarged and um, the investigations included a full septic screen and you can see some of the data that came back on day one of the admission. The platelets were a bit down. The CSF did not suggest that there was a meningitis and the child was admitted under the general paediatrician's having been resuscitated, having required 20 mils per kilo and obviously got onto back then uh, uh, an intriguing combination of antibiotics. Um, and, um, and then by day 11, the child was still not better and certainly not improving with these antibiotics, spiking to 39 degrees, developed a paralytic ileus. The liver became enlarged and was bright on ultrasound. There was some ascites, and you may have noticed that the initial bloods didn't include liver function tests because there was insufficient blood obtained. And, uh, and lo and behold, the ALT is 3,600. Interestingly, the bilirubin is not particularly high um, and the gamma GT you can see. So my question to you would be, what do you think of these liver function tests? What are they telling us? And I just want to unpick that for a moment. So focusing again, you, you know now that there's a cracking acute transaminitis. Um, and you know, what do you think of the liver function tests? Well, actually, there is only one liver function test amongst all of those. Well, perhaps two. Um, the main one is the albumin, um, and clearly uh, a low albumin has got very many excuses, very many um, etiological causes, and so yeah, just clearly failure of synthesis and liver failure is one of them, but we have to think about a whole bunch of other possibilities, including of course catabolism, which is the, the probably the commonest reason for us in our ID practice seeing children with low uh, albumin um, relatively acutely. But of course, if you're a nephrologist, you're going to be thinking about loss through the kidneys. And if you're a, a gastroenterologist, you'll be thinking about protein losing enteropathies and so on. So what about the liver dysfunction tests that were uh, present here? So we've got the ALT, but very often we'll also look at the AST. And the two are not identical. And I think that's important to appreciate that the ALT is more liver specific. The AST is present in liver and obviously does go up with a, um, if you've got hepatocyte damage and inflammation, but it is also distributed in many other tissues, as you can see. Um, and the rises and declines in, in these transaminases tends to be more abrupt with AST than ALT. But also you can tell quite a bit from the ratio of the AST to the ALT. And I will be testing you on this later. So uh, I, I just want you to, to, to have some feel for this, that if the AST to ALT ratio is low, then 
that is in that's consistent with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease for example um usually in acute viral hepatitis and drug related liver toxicity both enzymes are going to be fairly similar if the ast alt ratio is above one then uh, and, and significantly above one then it's more consistent with advancing fibrosis and possible cirrhosis and a high ast to alt ratio of more than two is often associated with alcoholic liver disease and of course none of this is set in stone and our patients don't read the textbooks but at least it gives you a framework for thinking about that ratio and why it might be worth doing both and occasionally of course you may see the alt that is normal but the ast is abnormal um, particularly in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease so what about the other things that we measure the alkaline phosphatase and the gamma gt and uh, you know i think it's almost reflex i i, I I challenge everybody in the audience to put their hand on their heart and say, no, 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 I never do the gamma GT. But I hope that I can change that for you because these are glycoprotein enzymes. They are bound to the canalicular membrane of the hepatocytes. So they're on the sort of distal side of the liver, if you like. But ALP, the alkaline phosphatase, is obviously very much present in bone and other tissues. Um, the gamma GT you can see is in, in some of the other um, biliary tract organs and also pancreas and to less extent spleen and kidneys they do not tell us much about inflammation in the liver they tell us about the biliary system um, but you, you can get a handle on that from the bilirubin anyway um, obviously causes of a raised gamma gt include um, induction by certain drugs and then mainly cholestasis so you get with cholestasis with stones or with any other reason for uh, including drug-induced cholestasis, you get membrane fragmentation and solubilization so that you get release of gamma GT from the cannulicular membranes. And, um, and, and frankly, the only real use I think of the gamma GT is if you've got a child with a raised ALP and you want to know whether it's coming from liver or bone, if the gamma GT is normal, then it's almost certainly going to be coming from bone rather than liver. But I generally never request it and don't find it useful. So what about the bilirubin? Um, uh, you know, everybody is familiar with the fact that unconjugated bilirubin is the lipid, lipid soluble bilirubin that's going to cross the blood brain barrier and in a newborn is going to cause uh, potentially connectorous. Conjugated um, bilirubin from the liver is water soluble and is going to get excreted in the bile, unless, of course, it can't be because there is an obstruction. Um, and that ability to conjugate is limited in the first two years of life. And after that, the conjugating capacity greatly exceeds the bilirubin delivery, which, of course, is coming from breakdown of red cells and so on. Unless, of course, you've got Gilbert syndrome. So I just run through this just as a little, little reminder. So you've got unconjugated bilirubin and albumin, albumin um, bound to albumin. Some of that is going to um, be uh, transferred into the, uh, across the hepatic sinusoid into the hepatocytes, where it is conjugated by the UDP enzyme. And you get conjugated bilirubin, which then passes through the biliary system to the small intestine as conjugated bilirubin, which, of course, is dark. Dark, um, that's um, bile color, dark green, and um, and then that is processed into urobilinogen. The vast majority of which ends up in the feces and gives some of the color to the feces. But actually, ten percent of it is reabsorbed through the ex the, the hepatobiliary um, extrahepatic system that is very, very important, for instance, for bile salts. I mean, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the bile salts are part of this um, uh, enterohepatic circulation, which means that you don't have to keep manufacturing bile salts because within one fatty meal, the enterohepatic circulation will reuse the bile salts up to 20 times. So the urobilinogen also travels along this um, pathway and gets back into the bloodstream is in the, and it is excreted. And that urobilinogen, because it's not been processed by any further bacteria, is clear so that's not what gives you dark urine when you've got obstruction it's of course conjugated bilirubin that is backing up into the bloodstream effectively and then being excreted through the kidney because it's water soluble so i hope that answers a few questions and of course shield bears affects the um uh, the the glucuronuration pathway so you've got a um uh, that that is impaired and you get 
from time to time unconjugated bilirubin um, backing up and causing trouble. Now, you all know, um, firstly, Gilbez is pretty common, um, and that it shouldn't be associated with liver inflammation. It should, you should have normal transaminases. I do recommend having a look at the, the, the self-help website that's been set up. This is not set up by doctors, um, but it's a forum where people with Gilbert's will compare their experiences. So, you know, the perceived wisdom is that people with Gilbert syndrome don't have itch. But actually, if you listen to the patients, many of them do experience itching. And many of them experience fatigue. And many of them experience other symptoms, which they find the medical profession overwhelmingly is extremely dismissive about. And I never completely understand us as doctors in our desire to read the textbooks and then not listen to our patients. You know, I think there's more to this than, than, uh, than meets the eye and it's worthwhile bearing that in mind. However, I don't want to go off on that rant um, because I want to carry on talking about liver function tests. So obviously some of the functional assays include prothrombin time um, and triglycerides and free fatty acids and ammonia. So um, thinking about ammonia, it is worth measuring this in all children with acute or chronic encephalopathy. Um, and obviously you're familiar with uh, the urea cycle defects and other inherited metabolic diseases requiring us to uh, be in inquisitive about consanguinity and so on. And there's a host of metabolic diseases. And again, yeah, depending on the practice, certainly um, for us, uh, we, we will have children coming through with any one of these defects who um, from time to time will decompensate and present with transaminitis. So back to this baby, AB, who is in yeah it, it is inextricably linked to my interest in transaminases so things did not go well and i got involved at this point where the um the the, the hepatitis was very severe and it was still unexplained and the child by that stage had got hepatosplenomegaly um clotting disorders the albumin had a nadir 23 um there was all sorts of um uh high dependency care required and we were obviously talking to kings and supporting the liver in every way we could and then the report came back from the mum and from the scalp lesion that this was actually HSV2. She had a primary HSV2 infection um, around the time of her labour and delivery. Dad actually did have a, a past medical history of, of recurrent lesions. And, um, and, and, you know, people have sex in late pregnancy. It's quite a good way of going into labor. And this was just very, very unfortunate. So we treated her, I mean, we started late, but fortunately she did not end up with CNS disease. So she's got disseminated herpes simplex, but um, did not end up with, with, uh, with, with damaging CNS lesions. And we treated her for ages with IVA cyclovir because she was so sick. Um, and then, in fact, I'd been brainwashed through my training at Duke University um, to recognize the late relapses, which sometimes are in the CNS, even if the initial presentation wasn't. And so we treated her for quite a while with maintenance doses to suppress the um, um, HSV2. But I have to say, I looked after her throughout her childhood. And even as a young adult, she still gets cutaneous relapses because her entire, um, all, all of her dorsal nerve roots got flooded with HSV2. And she found it very difficult as a teenager to discover that she was infected with a potentially um, sexually transmissible virus. I mean, actually, she, of course, never had um, perineal lesions. And, uh, and, and this is very hard for a teenager to start reading the literature and, and was a cause of a great deal of distress. Anyway, moving on, another child. Okay, 12-year-old boy, Malaysian family, born in Kota Baru um, on the Gulf and screened because mum had arrived in the UK and was diagnosed as hep B infected during a new pregnancy. So I, I really want you to be thinking about the, the need to screen the rest of the family if, uh, uh, if you're confronted with an uh, uh, antenatal diagnosis of either hep B or hep C. Really important to find out how many other children there are and whether they've been whether they've been tested and whether they're infected and if they're not infected with hep B then for well obviously now we're immunizing all of them but um, 
So this child was found to be, be infected. The viral load was 1,700, and the ALT was 92, and the AST was 66. So going back to what I told you before, what does that make you think? And has anybody got a sense of whether that viral load is, is very high or, or pretty low? And actually, it's very low. So it's very unlikely that hepatitis B explains these raised transaminases. And this is everything you need to know about hepatitis B in one graph. And I'll just go through it really briefly. So um, th this has been updated and superseded in some textbooks and, and, uh, and papers. But actually, I think this has stood the test of time, that there is an immune tolerant phase that we see over and over again with children who are infected perinatally. They don't mount an effective cellular immune response they remain in an immunotolerant phase for a variable length of time, which can be the whole of childhood. We have adult women in our family clinic who are still immunotolerant and have never recognized the virus as foreign. And at that stage, of course, you are E antigen positive, and the red line is indicating the viral load on a log scale, which goes up to astronomic levels. I mean, I've got many kids in the clinic with, with viral loads of 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 in that immunotolerant phase. And you can see the yellow line depicting the ALT as normal. So what that tells you is that the, the hepatitis B virus is hijacking your hepatocytes and very effectively churning out billions of copies of its own antigens and, and indeed virions. And yet that is not hepatotoxic. The, he the hepatocytes function fine with their machinery being hijacked to be a production line for hepatitis B. And during that phase, you've got minimal inflammation in the liver and you won't progress with fibrosis or anything towards cirrhosis. But then for reasons that are totally unclear, and I would love it if somebody in this audience was inspired enough to spend some time really under trying to understand this, we don't understand what the triggers are. I have got three-year-olds who have undergone immune clearance, whose immune systems have recognized this as foreign and have started attacking the hepatocytes, which of course, if they're expressing hep B um, and they recognize that as foreign, they're going to destroy this cellular immune responses, are going to destroy the liver cells. And with that, you get this fluctuating transaminitis. But you also begin to get immune control of the virus. And gradually, that viral load comes down to these intermediate levels. And then eventually, you get to the point where the E antigen is no longer detectable because it's not being produced in sufficient quantity and you are E antigen negative with a very low level viremia, less than 10 to the five copies per mil. And again, at that stage, you're not causing further scarring of the liver. So it is crucial to know how long the immune clearance phase lasts for. And that's why we use pegylated interferon, is to try and boost those responses. If after a year, the child has still got really dramatic transaminitis and a viral load that's still at the level of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 7 copies per mil, then we would think about using pegylated interferon to try and reduce the time that the child is in that um, active hepatitis phase, because all the way through that, they are developing scarring and potentially cirrhosis. So once you can get them into the low replicated phase, all is well for years and years until eventually the virus, because there is low level replication taking place, evolves into typically E antigen negative mutant strains that will then cause a new viremia and with it uh, a, a new um, immune response that uh, may start knocking off hepatocytes, causing transaminitis, causing inflammation, and with that persistent, um, unfortunately irrevocable um, fibrosis and, and potentially cirrhosis, unless of course you can uh, get them onto treatment. So at each of these stages, there are things that can be done to help. You wouldn't use interferon in the reactivation phase because you'd be flogging a dead horse that the immune system has already done all it can, but the virus has escaped that immunological control. So there is no point in using interferon. Um, but at that point, you'd be using uh, obviously anti-hepatitis B uh, drugs. Okay, this wasn't actually him, but this was the kind of uh, issue that we had. This is a, a, a Malaysian boy that I was telling you about. And 
what he's got is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this is now the commonest cause of asymptomatic elevated transaminases. So I um, recommend to you this, this study. It's now getting quite old from Nobili and colleagues at the Bambino Gesù Hospital in Rome, who they looked at uh, over 3,000 kids attending their ED who had had LFTs measured. So that was the starting point. And they managed to follow up um, uh, a proportion of these children. And in fact, from that original sample, only 158 underwent full diagnostic workup. So you know, clearly there are many things that have been missed here, but a lot of them, um, what they were trying to pick up was persistent transaminitis six months later. And, uh, and so you can see that it's a small proportion, but it's not insignificant. And when they started looking at the causes, the top two causes were obesity and some other kind of viral infection, particularly obviously Hep B and Hep C. What has transformed our practice is transient elastography or fibro scan. And, um, and this really has been fantastic. We've now uh, got um, uh, two of our CNSs trained to do fibro scans. And, um, and, and it means that we're no longer doing liver biopsies on these children to see how advanced the fibrosis is. And you typically will try uh, and use this um, ultrasonographic technique. You have to have a probe that is small enough to fit between the ribs. So that is the limiting issue for the smallest children if um, there's no probe that will actually give you a view of the liver between the ribs then you you can't get decent pictures of the um, sound waves being detected and bouncing back obviously if the liver is very rigid which it should not be because of fibrosis and, and eventually cirrhosis then uh, you, you, the speeds of the um, sound waves returning are much higher and you typically take 10, um, 10 passes in different directions so that you then get a composite picture of the E score. And so this is a median E score. 3.7 is extremely good. And the elasticity score, the interpretation is um, depicted here. You can see that it changes for different disease states and green is good and uh, yellow to orange is not so good and red is suggestive of advanced disease, metavir, stage uh, F4 and um, and the, you can see here that you've got, um, uh, sorry, I've just... <laughs> I need some money from Maria. Oh, it's in my coat pocket downstairs. <laughs> sorry. Um, so you can see that the uh, red lines are suggestive of, of cirrhosis and um, clearly this is very significant. So there is another quirk to the fibro scans, which is to measure fat in the liver. You can also, um, with some probes, capture the controlled attenuation parameter, the CAP score. And this is interpretable here. The CAP in the healthy liver should be below 200. Um, that's decibels per meter very strange unit. Um, above 250 is a worry, above 350 is a big worry, and this boy's CAP score was 357. So even though the E score, the elasticity score was quite encouraging and not, not particularly elevated, the CAP score was a big problem. But what actually this can do is to offer us a new tool in the biofeedback for young people who are seriously overweight, trying to find ways to really help them and motivate them to lose weight. The CAP score, you know, if you're able to help them see that, that you know, if you, t if you take this advice uh, uh, in terms of exercise and healthy eating and other uh, ways to control weight and we can then demonstrate to you that the CAP score is coming down that can be quite useful as part of a multi-professional approach to management which is a, another arm to our um, intentions particularly for the adolescents who are severely overweight. Right I just want to touch on a rather different case and this is particularly tricky so this is a 10 year old girl who presented with mildly raised LFTs which had been picked up because she was being investigated for urticaria. And this was recurrent urticaria, uh, thought to have multiple environmental triggers, didn't have known drug or food allergies, um, tended to respond to antihistamines. She was, she didn't have much by way of other symptoms. She'd always been slim, although um, you can see that she was on the 75th centile for height and the 50th centile for weight. And at the time she was seen, she was actually very well. 
Um, so investigations showed that she got a bit of an eosinophilia and this persistently raised AST and ALT. And, um, and a bit worryingly, that AST-ALT ratio was, was reversed. It was quite high compared to the ALT. Um, and we went through a series of investigations. Um, she'd got this raised ANA, which was of a rather non-specific pattern. Um, and you can see that the other autoantibodies were negative. But in the end, it was the IgA um, TTG that came back positive. And she'd actually got celiac disease, which was really tricky because she didn't have very obvious bowel syndromes, uh, symptoms. So going back to Nabili's study, um, and, and his colleagues, this was the further evidence. And one of the ones that I'd like to point out to you is the muscular dystrophy. So, of course, I've already said AST is, is found in muscle as well. And I'll never forget a boy actually from Morocco, well, the parents were from Morocco, who came to us, sent from Northwick Park actually, with a persistent transamylitis that was unexplained. And this boy walked in, he was age five, and there was there was just something about the way he walked that, that just triggered something in the back of my brain. And, uh, and I remember getting Ashley Brown, <coughs> this very serious professor, and, and everybody in the clinic, including the dad, sitting on the floor and then jumping up as fast as they could with this little boy. And he did an absolute classic Gowers uh, in, in order to get off the floor. And he had got a form of muscular dystrophy. And, and I was pleased to see that that was one of the things in the um, list of possible differential diagnoses. Um, so what's our approach to the investigation? So this is it really. Um, clearly everything hinges on history and thinking about what the possible um, uh, causes might have been, whether there is infectious uh, causes that would come back to our family hepatitis clinic uh, or other reasons. And so there's a whole series of things that we do early on, and these would be some of them. And then we might add, depending on the individual situation and the results of the first tests, these other issues, including creatine kinase, thinking about muscular dystrophies and so on, and thinking particularly about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, you know, I put the TTG in, in small print because it's pretty vanishingly rare as, as a cause. You know, this would be a very unusual presentation. And then, of course, we'd be doing fibrous scans and very, very rarely doing liver biopsies. And I showed a little bit of data from Hegarty and Dawan's 15-minute um, consultation that was published in the archives um, a couple of two, two or three years ago. And, and for the large part, I think that our approach is very much reflected by what they were suggesting. Um, but actually, they weren't talking in that about, um, uh, about Fibroscan, which is quite interesting because th these are colleagues from King's and they were still uh, preferring to do liver biopsy. And, and I imagine that may well have been changing their practice in the last three years. And that essentially is what I wanted to get across. I, I just hope that you take away from this that it isn't a good idea to ignore persistently raised transaminases because there are reasons for it and we should pay it attention even if the child is not going to come on, become unwell until they are adults. If we can intervene and work out what's going on, that would be the best way forward. So thank you very much. And I am going to open the floor for questions and stop screen sharing. Any things you wanted to ask? Beatrice, have I answered any of your questions from the point of view of a ED about to be consultant? Um, definitely. I mean, the, the context I was interested in is we um, at Chelsea, we did a um, prolonged jaundice clinic and invariably we'd always get calls from the midwives running the clinic with these elevated transaminitis. And not, you know, they would be in the 50s, 60s, so not crazy elevated, but we just never really had a consistent view from the consultant body on what to do about it. And some would ignore, which I know <laughs> now I won't do. <laughs> and then others would just repeat them on a weekly basis and um, so it's just been really helpful yeah I, that actually that's really helpful I, I didn't say this but there's absolutely no point in repeating them on a weekly basis I yeah mean, if you've had a really nasty insult to your liver if you've had hep a and your transaminases went to 3000 it's going to take six months for them to come back to normal 
And there's nothing to be gained by um, repeated and, and frequent um, uh, measurement other than totally traumatizing the young person. So um, I, I think that's quite good to, to, to put that in perspective. I mean, for a very little baby, I certainly would want to probably bring them back within a couple of months. And, and quite obviously, you don't want to miss some kind of um, neonatal hepatitis that's, um, uh, well, particularly if it's... Uh, uh, associated with a, a conjugated bilirubinemia. Um, but uh, for the older kids, where there's been an insult that's reasonably good explanation for what's wrong, then I'm happy to leave it for, for three months or six months before I repeat the LFTs. But just don't lose sight of them. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great.